Welcome ladies and gentlemen, I'm the Serious Strategy Gamer and I am very excited today because we are going to play a new game. Rule the Waves 3 is about to come out and Matrix was kind enough to provide a copy to me. Not sponsored, but I do like this game so I do want to show it to you guys. Rule of the Waves 3 is of course a game about designing warships and getting them into battle and, and doing all that strategic stuff around that. And if you know that channel, this channel at all, you know I like designing warships. So, without further ado, let's jump into it. We are going to play um, in a way that showcases the new features a little bit. That is going to be mostly focused on the missile area. So the timeline has been extended to 1970. Uh, along with a couple of other mm, a little bit small improvements but really that is the big thing the jet age the missile age that is what we want to try out here so we're going to start in 1935 i think that's a good start because it shows you a little bit of the battleship area it shows you the aircraft carriers and then the missile age into the 1970s without waiting too too long so as you can already see the game is not to be honest the most beautiful game that you've ever seen but there is so much beauty going on in the mechanics underneath the hood. So I think that is all uh, fantastic for it. Right. So we're going to play as Japan and we're going to click on that little button over here. And here you can see the first overview. And it does make sense to briefly look at that because there is some important information here. Most importantly, we can do a surprise attack. So when a war starts, we have a chance of actually um, doing a surprise attack on the enemy, something like a torpedo attack in the 1890s and like the early 1900s, like the Porter through attack uh, that Japan did historically against Russia, but also something like uh, the Pearl Harbor attack that of course happened a little bit later with aircraft carriers. We can do kamikaze attacks if we're losing the war. We hope that that will never come to it. And this is the more important bit. We do have some advantages and disadvantages. Our advantages is going to be light forces and torpedo warfare and all aircraft carrier stuff basically. But our disadvantage is going to be radar. We just need to be aware of that. And I really like the light forces and torpedo advantage because I think that's that's uh, that's really fantastic. There was a school in like the 19, uh, sorry, in the 1800s, the um, Jean de Colle, I believe, the French school originally, which held that uh, light forces and torpedo warfare were the war of the future. So I think it's uh, fun to try that out. So without further ado, let's start the game. And I am going to go through this in a little bit of a tutorial style and briefly talk in this episode about our grand strategic outlook, how, what we want to achieve, how we want to go uh, on to that in the big picture and then the next couple of episodes we're going to look at designing ships and hopefully getting them into battles at some point so this is the first uh, thing that you see i like to go for large fleet sizes that's a little bit more forgiving you can lose ships and still sort of build them up of course that means the ai also has larger fleets but it just makes it a little bit more fun and i think it's closer to historical timelines you can also do various other things like harsher peace deals uh, go for more tech variation so tech is always a little bit verified that, so that you don't have perfect hindsight uh, but i think slight variation is okay maximum air base size 100 that's that's all fine and we're going to go with the game slot 8 down here the game will initially generate a fleet that you're going to start out with and that is a little bit i think in the previous versions you could do that on your own and uh, this time you can't so the game is going to do that for us and this is already the main screen of the game down here. You can see various things down here. A, this is Excel. This is an Excel war game, really. Um, and B, this is the map. Now, we're going to talk about the map later on. Let's briefly focus on our ships down here. You can see that different columns down here. Uh, the type, so BB, that's a battleship. Heavy cruiser. I, I'm not entirely sure what CA actually meant. I think cruiser armored or something like that. Then there are light cruisers, cruiser light. There are aircraft carriers, that is the CV, and then destroyers. And then there can also be other smaller ships and stuff like that. But these are the main types that we're going to be facing here. Now, I personally dislike that the game is sorted by this overall because you can see some of these ships in this displacement column down here are actually much larger than some of the other ones, specifically aircraft carriers. So what I like to do is sort this stuff here by displacement and I think that gives us a better picture because that puts all the big ships up here in the top and all of the smaller ships down here in the bottom. So you can see we've got the for example the battleship Mikasa which is a Mikasa class. There are also other ships of the same class the Fuji and the Shikishima and I'm gonna butcher a lot of these names 
always the same displacement. They have a design speed of 23 knots, but you can see the Mikasa itself already has a little bit fouled engines, so that is already slowed down a little bit. That's just an aspect of aging. We can get rid of that by refurbishing the engines, but that of course takes some money and some time. So for now we're going to accept that. The other information here, radar, not a thing yet, not in 1935, but it is going to become relevant later on. ASW, so anti-submarine warfare, the capabilities against enemy submarines, and as you can see, of course, destroyers are a little bit better at that than battleships, because these are guys are really built against submarines. You can see the year that the ship was originally built. Some of these ships are fairly old, 20 years old. That is that is quite some age. But Still, for a battleship that is well within its useful lifetime, you can see the location. Uh, all of our ships are in Northeast Asia. The map is distributed in various uh, different sectors, Central Pacific, Northern Pacific, and all of that. There's the status, whether it's active fleet, which means you're paying full maintenance, reserve fleet, that means you're paying less maintenance, or mothballed, you're paying even less maintenance, but the flip side of that is that the crew quality will be a little bit more limited as they are in reserve or mothballed respectively. And then there's a brief description of the ship which is pretty useful. In this case, you can see that these ships carry 12 14-inch guns, and that's not all there is to it, because what I really, really like about this game is this screen over here. And we're going to talk about that in a lot more detail over time. But that is basically showing you all of the different parameters that a ship can have. And not all of them are equally important, but some of them are. And you can see here, over here, there's a sort of top-down description of the ship. And to be honest, I hate it already because just look at this layout. This is a six turret layout with six uh, double turrets in the 14 inch caliber and that's not great because you can click on this little tick, tick box here and that shows you the firing arcs of these ships and these are fairly old ships 1915 that does make a lot of sense in 1915 ships were designed with the fleet action in mind so something like the battle of Jutland where you had massive fleets colliding with one another and they were really um, thought out to be in a battle line so they were all facing to the side and you would have all of these six turrets being able to fire off to the side. But in 1935, fleets have come down in their sizes, it's getting a lot more sort of individual ships taking on other ships, or at least smaller battleships. It's not going to be like 20 dreadnoughts fighting off against 20 dreadnoughts. It's more like two against three or something like that. And at that point, just being broadside to one another and, and sailing ahead for an hour, that just doesn't happen that often anymore. So at this point, it's a lot more about flexibility and these guns are not that flexible. You can see to the front, only really these two turrets, this one and this one can fire. So you only have four guns being able to fire off to the front. That's only a third of the total guns. Not great, I dislike that. There's, there's not much flexibility in these turrets here in the middle. Of course, it's still better than some of the uh, World War I German battleships with the hexagonal layout. So in that sense, it's still a little bit better, but uh, I still kind of dislike it. Right, we're not going to talk about all of the other parameters here, but we are briefly going to look at some other ship classes here. You can also double click, that gives you a quicker overview, but it doesn't include all of the information. Nevertheless, you can see there are also five turret, five dual turrets of 14 inch guns. Honestly, likewise, not that great, but not quite as bad with only a single turret here in the center. Um, these are the Katori class, and then we've also got the Sagami, which has 12 guns. And this one at least is a little bit more modern in its design, although the game uh, technically put it in the same category over here. And that has 12 guns. Now these are only 13 inches of caliber, which means the displacement of this entire thing is somewhat lower. But you can see the layout here is a lot more modern with two turrets to the front, two to the rear, and this uh, sort of superimposed layout where these two turrets can fire in this direction and these can fire in that direction. So honestly, this one I like a lot more. You can also see that this guy has a couple of dual purpose even, so also capable of uh, shooting against enemy aircraft. Uh, secondary guns here, 12 inches of dual purpose guns, that sounds fairly lovely, and they're in turrets of two. So this is a much, much better, much more modern design and notice that it's also 
pretty fast. I would even call this maybe a battle cruiser. I like these ships. They're undergunned to go up against other battleships, but this is 1935. Chances are we're not gonna fight against that many battleships anymore. So I kind of like this. This has potential for the future. And this is already what you should be doing um, as you're starting the game. Just sort of think out what you've got, what are your gaps, what can you be needing, because the Katori class is here, 21 knots. That is not very fast. That is not very fast. It's not very future-proof. That is something that we might put into storage or even completely disband to save some of these maintenance costs because we're going to need to talk about our budget here in a second. Nevertheless, you should also take a brief look at the armor over here, and that is 11 inches off belt armor, 2.5 inches off deck armor. Now compare that to this ship over here, which has a little bit less belt armor, but a lot more deck armor. And the difference that that makes is at different engagement ranges, these things are going to be uh, relevant to a different degree. So at very short distances, uh, the belt armor, that's the side armor of the ship, is going to be much more relevant because you're shooting just in a very flat trajectory and, and as you're sort of getting a hit on the enemy, uh, it's probably going to be on the side. Whereas at very long distances, you're going to shoot almost into the sky and then the shell is going to come down diving into the other ship at its deck armor, so at its top armor if you want. So that's a little bit more relevant for long range engagements. So just something to keep in mind. We can also briefly take a look at our aircraft carriers here, the two Hosho classes, Hosho and Shakoku. Now. Both of these, to be honest, are not that impressive. They're only carrying 45 aircraft each. That's not great. The speed is okay-ish, 29 knots. That's not too bad, but it's not that great either. They're pretty fairly small, 18,000 tons. They're carrying six inch guns, which is not great because actually they're not dual purpose, so they can't be used against aircraft, which means you have a battle, which means you have an aircraft carrier that's really suited to go up against light ships at six inch guns. I don't really understand the point of this. Um, and one and a half inches of deck armor, that's also not great because if you're being bombed, uh, that's not gonna hold off a lot. So yeah, not great these ships. We definitely need to be looking at that. We've got a couple of heavy cruisers here, all of the Takiwa, Tokiwa class. These guys look fairly crowded, but they're actually fairly good ships, I think. So eight eight inch guns. Um, two in the front, two in the rear. That's fine. They look superimposed, so they can fire off to the side. And that's that's fairly cool. And a couple of four-inch guns, which are dual-purpose, so they can also provide a good amount of anti-aircraft carrier. They're also medium and light guns, and we're going to talk about the difference as we are designing ships. Uh, but honestly, not a bad ship. Also fairly good speed here. There are a couple of light ships that we don't want to be too concerned about, but you can already see... Uh, these guys have six inch guns, 12 of them, fairly decent layout, lots of secondary guns too. Wait a minute, is all of that secondary guns? Okay, we need to look at that in a little bit more detail, so let's open the design here. And yeah, these guys have three triple turrets, four triple turrets, and then got a lot of these wing turrets here uh, with the four inches. And these can be made to dual purpose, and that will give them some heavy anti-air, but again, more about this interface later. They're also carrying mines, but then again, remember how Japan is very much focused on light forces. And that is the realm of the destroyers and some of these light cruisers. Specifically, everything here that says TT, these guys are carrying torpedo tubes above water. Above water means you don't have to, uh, they're not submerged basically, and that's fine, that's pretty good for uh, the later games and you can say see they're sort of in the center line over here and They can fire off torpedo salvos to either side. I don't know. No, it doesn't show the turret arcs here But yeah, that's fairly lovely. That's that's a lot of things. Is that actually? That yeah, no, that, that is a legal design. So that's fine That's cool nine torpedo tubes on these guys eight on these guys. You've got probably What is that quadruple torpedo mounts? The other guy had triple torpedo mounts. No, you have a very weird design with three triple ones and one one uh, double. But that's fine. A lot of torpedo tubes are good for us. Decent speed on these smaller ships, 33, 34 knots. 
Some of them are showing different letters over here. The M means that these guys are carrying mines. I'm not entirely sure why you'd show that here. I, to me, it's just obvious here. Um, that's not that important. What is a little bit more important is this S and this A class over here. The ships that have an S here mean that they are designed for short range. You are not going to be able to move these guys during wartime between different zones. At least not uh, between different zones that aren't your home territory. So they're very much um, short range ships, mostly used for home defense. I'm not sure that they're going to be that useful. And likewise, the A means that they have cramped accommodations. So crews are going to be a little bit more cramped together. That makes them a little bit more susceptible to morale loss or bad health. So it's just a lot less reliable as a, as a type of ship. Speaking of reliability, one of the things that I should already point out or might already point out is the engine priority over here. So that is likewise one of the big indicators that dictates where a ship can be used. A ship that's built for speed, that's great. That saves you some weight. You can put weight into other categories and the engine just becomes a little bit um, more speedy or to be more precise, at the same speed, the engine is going to become smaller. And again, you have more space for other stuff, whereas normal is the average kind of thing and reliability makes it a lot, le loss less, a lot less likely to break down, but at the cost of a bigger machinery. On the other hand, speed, a lot more likely to break down. That probably doesn't matter if you are very close to home and you can just go back into harbor, repair your thing and uh, be fine with that. So if it's a short range, yeah, you might go for speed. But if it's really supposed to operate at very long distances from home, you probably want a reliable engine or something in between at least. Now, without further ado then, um, I think we don't need to look at all of these ships here in detail, but you can see they have different main calibers. Um, even some of our smaller destroyers here have actually five inch guns. That's fine. We can maybe even use these guys later on for enemy air, for anti-air defenses, but we'll need to see about that. Now, what's going to be our strategy? We are here. You can actually see that at this gray bar. This is our fleet. Our fleet is mostly stationed compared to all of the other ones. Come on, get me over here. Um, none of the other nations have any presences. Um, let's get rid of this here for a second. Uh, no, most of the other nations don't have any presence in Northeast Asia, except there's a small Chinese fleet and a small English fleet, uh, or British fleet, I should say. And of course, a giant Japanese fleet in this area precisely. Now, this is pretty much where we are going to be playing and where we're going to try to conquer some of the other territories that are here. That is, of course, historical. Um, I should note that this game is not a historical simulator and it's not a grand strategy game. You don't have control which war is going to start and it's not historical in the sense that we're going to see a second world war the way it happened. It is nevertheless likely that we're going to get into conflict with democratic nations rather than other dictatorships, except for maybe the Soviet Union. Um, and we can steer that a little bit by setting the intelligence level with other nations. For example, we can set the intelligence with the Soviet Union as fairly high, and that means we're going to get intel on them, of course, but it also means that potentially there might be some misunderstanding, a spy might be discovered, there's going to be um, some sort of problem, and ultimately we can use that to increase tensions, and as soon as these tensions uh, cross a certain threshold, you know that you can actually declare war. So that might be very useful. Right, we can actually look at the um, places that are down here. For example, you can see that the Russian Far East is, of course, controlled by the Soviet Union. China is controlled by China, except for certain parts of it, which are controlled by us or the Brits, respectively. And the same down here in Southeast Asia. Most of our competitors are actually based in Europe, of course, and that is either in the Baltic, Northern Europe or the Mediterranean. Now, it's fairly difficult for us to be operating that far from home. It would be fantastic if we could sink their fleet and then sort of blockade England, but that's not going to work. It's just way too far away from us. Um, our ships would be breaking down. We can't support them there. We don't have any bases there. So we're going to be focused on this. On the flip side, most of the other nations are not going to be able to operate in our home waters either. So we don't need to be building a fleet 
that will engage their main battle fleets down here in Northeast Asia. We are mostly going to be focused on dealing with smaller stuff that they can actually send here, but where we can sort of attrit them down in an attritional battle, I guess. And that is indeed what, of course, was a little bit at least the Japanese strategy in World War II or running up to it to attrition down especially the American forces as they are crossing the Atlantic and then defeat them in the big battle down here. Now here's the next thing that we need to be talking about and that is the disposition of forces. Our naval budget currently is 207,000, I'm gonna call that 207 million per year. That's the same number you can see down here and that's broken down into monthly budget too. But let's compare it for a second here again some of our competitors. Germany, France, Italy, yeah, they are spending less than we are. That's that's good news. China is definitely spending less. Soviet Union, yeah, that's all good. But Great Britain, 300 million. US of A, 270 million. And that's only going to expand. So these guys are spending a lot more. And you can see that in their tonnage too. We've got a fleet tonnage of 400,000. Great Britain has all more than 50%, well, roughly 50% more. And the United States really isn't that far behind. Where does that fall? We've got currently eight battleships. One, of, one more is building. We should be looking at that. Um, Great Britain has 11. USA has seven. These guys actually are sort of comparable to our tonnage. So that's interesting. We don't have much of a battleship disadvantage. But remember, a lot of our battleships are fairly old, are not that great designs. So I'm not sure whether that's that's really as close as it appears to be, but we'll need to see. Slightly more concerning issue here, carriers. We've got two carriers worth uh, 18,000 tons each, 36,000 in total. Look at the Americans here. They are beating us by a factor of six. We'll definitely need to design a carrier. And I think that is the first thing that we're going to do next time around. We're not even building one. Um, Great Britain has four, again, almost three times as much as we have. So that's very, very concerning. Although their, their carriers seem to be pretty small as well. We can actually click on that and check these guys out. So yeah, fairly small, but still 62 aircraft. I think ours had 48. And the Americans, their carriers, the Saratoga class, not the historical Saratoga class, but a hundred aircraft each. So this is this is this is so pathetic. I think we have we have a hundred aircraft in total. They've got four hundred, and they are building another one, the Ranger class, and they are even building a light aircraft carrier too. Fairly small, but still, that's sort of almost ah, well, it's two thirds of of our carriers. So it's pretty significant. Um, also. Jesus, look at this. Um, there, are, there are a couple of noteworthy things over here. So firstly, they're carrying 16 5-inch dual-purpose guns, so they are actually fairly well set up against enemy air threats. So we're going to have a tougher time to break through this and, and even damage it. And then they've got 10 inches of belt armor, which is honestly fairly excessive for, for a carrier. That's, that's a carrier that can get into a gunfight. Um, and well, it can't deal out a lot of damage. Our six inch guns are going to be slightly better at that, but it can definitely tank a lot of damage. So that's, that's I think, more than we had on some of our battleships. So hmm, fairly significant. Um, let's see about how that is going to work. Do we have any other strength though? Uh, we have five heavy cruisers compared to four of the US, but sort of similar tonnage. So they are going to be tougher than ours. Uh, Great Britain, again, beating us 2 to 1 in terms of tonnage. Mm, not great. Light cruisers. Again, we have a lot of ships, but they seem to be fairly small, especially when you compare them to the, some of the stuff that the US has. Um, and then we've got a decent number of destroyers, but again, it's not that amazing, I would say. So these are things that we definitely need to be taking care of and building up our strategy there. Now, that being said, let's look at our budget here. We've got 207 million per year. That breaks down to 17 uh, million per month, of which we are spending 9.3 on maintenance. So that's all of the ships in service right now. We're paying 7.6 on ships under construction. That is a different tab over here. We are currently building two ships. 
the Yamashira. That's a new class of battleship, and we'll need to check that out. Oh my god, look at that. That is a that is a fantastic ship. Um, by the looks of it, it has 16-inch guns, so bigger than the ones that we currently have. Um, and it has 12 of them in a decent loadout of these two triple uh, two triple turrets front, two triple turrets in the rear. Fantastic. That's a very decent broadside. Um, it also has fairly good secondary armament in these 5 inch guns, 12 inches of belt armor, but more importantly, 5 inches of deck armor. That is really going to be a fantastic long range dual ship uh, that can deal out a lot of damage. Let's actually look at the scorecard here in the design in a little bit more detail. And again, I'm going to talk about that in more detail um, throughout this series, but I like this ship. But it is costing us. 5.2 million to build that per month so that is of course that is that is almost a third of our entire budget for that one ship alone just to be building it nothing else yet uh, and then we are building the atsuma that's another heavy cruiser which honestly also looks okay-ish nine eight inch guns i think the other ones had eight inch uh, eight eight inch guns uh, but this loadout i prefer a little bit more guns facing to the front less to the rear um, but it's 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 fine and 33 knots, I, I like that too. So these are good ships, but can we afford that? The answer is no. Our monthly budget is currently minus almost 4 million. Um, so that's not great. Also notice we are spending 1.3 million on research. I would like to tackle that up a little bit. We're going to talk about this in more detail here. And that is we're going to bung, bump that up to 12% because we really need to be getting onto the technological ra uh, uh, race down here. That's the one thing. That's how much you're spending. These are all of the categories that you are actually spending that on. And you also have the other tab of naval guns. This is slightly easier to explain. These are all the guns that are in the game. These are the ones that you have either not researched, that you have researched and are of normal quality, zero, are of bad quality, minus one, or are at better quality if there's a one or two. Now, to be honest, nothing too exciting here we have 16 inch guns it would be nice to get better versions of these guns but this is not a high priority as we are getting into the missile age and uh, before that into the uh, more aircraft carrier range now the next thing is all of these different categories over here and what i like to do is set all of these research levels to low that is purely relative as the indicator tells us over here so that is pretty much the same. All of them to medium is the same as all of them low. So you're basically taking that budget and redistributing it according to the priority. And if everything is low, nothing is lower than anything else. But that allows us to prioritize a couple of things. And what we should be prioritizing is everything that has to do with heavier than air and shipboard aircraft operations. And of course, light torpedo things all of these things that we do have advantages on i like to double down on advantages and that is what we're going to do we're also going to do a medium priority on fire control on hull construction armor development and machinery development these are all fairly useful things armor development is something that we're going to phase out over time but for now that is something that's going to be okay i also like good turrets and i really really love good ship design so that is giving you access to new features that otherwise you wouldn't be able to use. So that's great. A uh, torpedo technology, I would also at least like a medium there and on submarines. Everything else I think are gonna be fine for now. Um, Anti-aircraft artillery, that's also useful, although we already have the five inch dual guns there. So that's nice. And naval guns, let's go for medium for now. And once we have maybe one or two very good guns, uh, we can see whether we can refocus our efforts there. But for now, that is going to be our focus here. Uh, that means our monthly balance is even lower. And that means we will need to be talking about getting some of these ships to a readiness level that maybe isn't quite as high. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take these battleships. They are going to be costing by far the most over here. And we already noticed that these guys are maybe not the best. And we're going to send them to the reserve fleet. That means we're going to save a ton of money here to begin with now we don't need to be at a balanced budget actually it's going to be fine to run a slight deficit uh, in about 13 or 18 months uh, all of these costs here are going to come down 
So as long as we could go for 30 months, these costs would be fine. But there are also some things that are modifying that. So for the moment, I think we would be looking at six or seven turns, and that's going to be 13 turns. So that's not quite okay yet, but we are getting there. So I think that's that's going to be okay-ish. And to be honest, maybe we can even take these ships, the even older ones, and put them to mothballed. That is going to drop down these costs again by around 300. So it's it's not as great, but you are sort of getting there a little bit. Um, I'm also going to put the heavy cruisers into reserve. That should be... Oh, uh, one of them is in Southeast Asia, so these guys cannot actually be put into reserve. Only the guys that are actually in the home territory. Um, and that's going to be fine. You, you too, please. No, you are already. Good. Um, and yeah, you can see the difference here. Uh, just reserve fleet means costs are pretty much halved. So that's that's actually pretty good. Um, light cruisers, I think these guys down here. Yeah, I mean, they're not that expensive to in, in terms of upkeep. But still, we're going to put you into reserve and see whether that is going to come down here. And now you can see our budget is at minus 1.8 million. We've got... 18 million in the banks or so, so for 10 turns or so that should be working out. That's not quite enough to get there, but you know what? Tensions are going to rise. We're probably going to get a little bit more budget from the government um, as time goes on. But yeah, that's fine. So next time around, we're going to design an aircraft carrier and see whether we can squeeze that in the budget at all and uh, talk a little bit about our other ship. So very much looking forward to that. Do leave a like and everything and do let me know what do you think about uh, Rule the Revs 3? What our strategy should be? And do let me know what specific designs you would like to see in this little Let's Play. For now, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you around soon. Bye-bye, guys.